All right, Matthew chapter 9, let's dig right in there, starting in verse number 1. The Bible reads, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, this is one of those passages where I want to turn to another one of the accounts of this story in the gospel where we get more information. And uh, I've, I brought this up last week. I bring it up again. You know, I really encourage you to, to make it a point at some point to just do your own Bible study through the Gospels and, and make notes and compare. And it's even easier to do these days with, you know, with more technology. You could copy and paste stuff, put them side by side, you know, get yourself a digital Bible and, and open up a, a text document and just move stuff around. And it's really interesting when you put everything together, there's oftentimes a lot of things that you'll learn because you've missed it. You've missed some of the differences maybe when you read over it. And I'm going to show another one of those tonight. But um, it's just, you're going to learn a lot more. So Bible reading, absolutely. I think everyone should be reading the Bible every day. And I think that's something that you ought to do and never stop doing. Bible study is something that a lot of people don't do. And I think that people should. Now, if you're brand new to reading the Bible, if you've never even read the Bible cover to cover one time, I don't recommend getting involved in doing a full Bible study until you've read through the Bible at least a few times, just enough to get yourself familiar with the Bible in general and the stories and things, you know, just kind of get them in order. It takes you a few times of reading it before you start feeling more comfortable of, oh yeah, okay, I'm, you know, where everything fits in and the types of stories that are there. But once you get to that level, then, then definitely I think you should start introducing some types of Bible study into your learning. And whether that be specific topics you're going through, I think the Gospels is a really good one to just start comparing them side by side. Even just particular stories, if you don't do the full book, just kind of pick out different stories you know you hear a lot of and, and put them all together and see what you can learn from that. We're going to look at Mark chapter 2, so keep your place in Matthew 9. We're going to flip backwards to, uh, well, forwards in your Bible, but uh, Mark chapter 2. And we're going to see a little bit more detail about how they brought in this guy that was sick of the palsy, which is lying on a bed. Because it says in, in Matthew, it says that Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. But when we read the account in Mark, we see, you know, kind of how great their faith was and what they were willing to do and, and what they ended up doing to bring this guy unto Jesus that prompted Jesus to say, hey, thy sins be forgiven thee when he saw their faith. Look at verse number three of Mark chapter two. The Bible says, and they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Basically what happens that Jesus, it says that there's this whole crowd around him. It says that people won't even get to him because of the press. Like there's so many people there. They were just standing like, like really packed in tight where he, was, where he was teaching and where he was preaching. And this guy wanted to be healed. And his buddies are bringing him there. So he's got four guys that are carrying him on this bed, right? He's on a stretcher, on a bed, whatever. He's, he's, they're kind of bringing him to Jesus because he can't walk. And they want this guy to be healed. And they go to the place where Jesus is at, and there's no way they're going to bring this guy through the crowd. I mean, they're just packed in too tight. So what they do is actually go up to the roof. And they basically break open the roof of the house where Jesus is at in teaching and start lowering this guy in so that he could be healed of Jesus Christ. So we're going to see in verse number four here, Mark chapter two, it says, And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. So you can see the, you know, the, the, a fuller picture of what's going on here as they're lowering this guy down. You know, this is probably one of the few occasions where I wouldn't be really, really upset that someone, if someone's tearing my roof up, we're like, man, you know, I gotta, I gotta fix that. You breaking my roof down? Hey, this guy got healed of his palsy. Like, amen, praise God for that. I'll deal with the, with the roof another day. But, um, you know, so, so this is kind of a big event. 
And Jesus sees that and he, and he blesses him for it. You know, there's this great blessing and this healing that comes upon this guy. And, and first of all, it's not even healing. He just says, wow, he sees their faith. Your sins are forgiven you. He's not even healed. But hey, how much more would you rather just have that as the, as the healing, as the gift, and say, hey, I was brought to Jesus and he forgave all my sins. Amen. That's so much more valuable than being able to get up and walk away from Jesus. Imagine if, how sad it would be if he, was, if he showed up, he was healed physically, but his soul was still damned because he wasn't trusting in Christ. That like, yeah, his friends brought him there and Jesus healed him, but he wasn't really, you know, he, he never trusted his soul to Christ. He never, he never put his faith on him. And then he, when he died, he ended up going to hell. That, that healing physically really would have been very little done for him ultimately. But just the fact that Jesus said, hey, your sins be forgiven you. Now, stay here in Mark chapter 2. Because in, in Matthew 9, verse number 3, the Bible says, And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. So they're saying, This guy's blaspheming. He's just, he just told this guy that his sins are forgiven. And it doesn't tell us this in Matthew, but in Mark, look at verse number 7, the Bible says, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? Now that, you know, this may be the Pharisees saying this, but that is a true statement. Or the scribes, I think, the scribes that said this. That's a true statement. Who can forgive sins but God only? And I love how Jesus answers them. You can flip back to Matthew chapter 9. Because this is one of the, event, one of the times, one of the events where Jesus is proving he is God in the flesh. He is not only the Son of Man, as he, as he refer, refers to himself here, not only the Son of God, but actually part of the three in one. God in the flesh that has come and is capable of forgiving sins. Verse number four, the Bible says, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? And there's just another indication. I mean, Jesus was able to know their thoughts as he's on this earth, which is pretty incredible. There's some times where the, where the Bible talks about that, and I think he's able to make perceptions on what's going on in people's lives. But here it's like he knows their thoughts and, and automatically knows, wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? There's so many people, I don't think he's just necessarily focused in on them and just try, you know, just reading their body language. I think he actually knows, like, these guys are just thinking, well, who can, for, you know, this guy's a blasphemer. And he knows that's what they're thinking. And then he says this, verse 5, For whether it's easier, easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and walk? You're saying, which one of these things do you think is easier? For me just to stand here and say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and walk? And see, they would probably say it's even harder for the guy to be healed, right? Even though it would, I mean, it is harder for the guy's sins to be forgiven. But he's just saying, you know what? Doesn't matter. Verse number six, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He's saying, which one of these is harder to do? Well, either way, just so you know that I, that I do have power to forgive sins on the earth. It says, then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed and go into thine house. He said, there you go. Here's your proof. You want to know if I can forgive sins on the earth? Rise up and walk. And the guy says here, and he arose and departed to his house. Amen. Completely healed in an instant. Just for, you know, the fact that Jesus is doing, like, he's, he's doing this obviously for a reason. He's proving a point. This isn't just that he has these magical powers. Look, it's so evident that Jesus Christ, if he was some charlatan, if he was uh, 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 you know, just pulling the wool over people's eyes, he was extremely evil. And this is why the Jews think so poorly of Jesus Christ and denigrate him and say he's burning in hot excrement and all the other wicked, blasphemous things that they say because they really do believe that he was not 
a good man at all, that he is a blasphemer, that he was someone that's like an antichrist and worked for the devil as opposed to being the son of God. Because he has to be either one or the other. Those are the only, with, with everything that's being done, with the fact that when, you know, when Thomas said, you know, hey, unless I put my hand into the, into the print of the nails, I will not believe. And Jesus comes to him and he says, here, Thomas, put your hand right here. Put it into my side and put your fingers into the holes of my hand and be not doubtful, but, but believing. And he says, uh, you know, my Lord and my God. And Jesus responded to him and said, Thomas, because thou hast seen, thou hast believed. He doesn't say, whoa, whoa, hold on a second there, Thomas. I'm not God. He says, because you've seen it, you believe. All throughout the scripture, yes, Jesus is the son of God. Yes, he's the son of man. But he never refutes being the son of God. And he actually says that he is, you know, when people are saying, well, wait a minute. If you're saying you're the son of God, that makes you equal with God. He doesn't deny that either. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. That's true. And here he takes this, this step of saying, hey, just so you know, because they're saying, well, who can forgive sins but God? Hey, just so you know that I can forgive sins? Here you go. So he's doing all these great works. He's doing all these great miracles. He's healing people. We're going to see later in this chapter that they're saying, oh, the only reason he's able to cast out devils is because Satan's giving him that power to do so. That's the way that the Jews thought about Jesus Christ. But funny, they only talk about him that way when it's, when it's casting out devils because it's the only way that their, that their theory would even fit saying that like, oh, well, because Satan has power over the devils and he's getting that power through Satan. What about all the healing? Amen. They're never saying, oh, yeah, he, he, he's letting the, the palsy man to walk under the power of Satan. Why? Because Satan's the one who binds people. Satan's the one who's, who's bringing people into bondage. Jesus is the one who's freeing them of that bondage. All throughout the scripture, he's proving, you know what, this is of God. The healing, the, the blind receiving their sight, the deaf hearing, bringing someone back to life from the dead, uh, which happens in this story too. I mean, there's so many amazing miracles that happen in this one chapter of the Bible. Just, you cannot walk away from this and say, oh yeah, Jesus, he was just another prophet. Just like Muhammad and Abraham and Moses. No. No, Jesus is very, very, very different. That's right. Amen. Jesus is the Savior. And, and you cannot read the Bible and, and like I said, walk away with either one or the other saying he's either just the worst you know, person ever in the world because he tricked so many people and deceived so many people into thinking he was the Son of God or he's the Son of God. There's no middle ground with Jesus Christ. I, I, it blows me away how people just want to say, well, I kind of like the teachings of Jesus. You know, people point to, the, to you know, these God haters or whoever, people who just don't like the Bible. They don't like the Old Testament. They don't like the commandments. Well, I just go by what, what Jesus says. Really? They say that flippantly. And the reason why is because they still don't read the Bible. They just hear a verse here and there that they like, that sounds good. Well, Jesus taught to love people. Jesus healed people. They hear all these good things that Jesus did, and he did a lot of them. But what about when Jesus is claiming to be the Son of God? When Jesus is claiming to be God in the flesh? When he's claiming these things, do you still just believe the words of Jesus? Because if you believe that, then you have to believe all of it. You have to. You can't just take one without the other. He's saying he's God. He also said he didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets. Are you going to believe that? People speak too often out of ignorance and they, just, they, they take what they want to believe just based on their own wicked heart of what they want to believe instead of just believing in the truth and caring about what's true and what's right. That's what I believe. I have no interest in, in trying to figure out what's, what sounds the best or what's going to work out the best for me. I just want to know what's right and what's true. And that's why I accept the entire Bible because it's the Word of God. Let's keep going here. Verse number 7. 
uh, and he rose and departed to his house, verse number eight. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God. And I love this. Jesus does all these works, and what happens with the people? They glorified God. Yeah. And this, is, uh, this ought to be the way that your Christian life works also. Now, you may not be going around and healing people and, and doing great miracles like Jesus did, but whatever works that you're doing for the Father should bring glory unto him. Jesus didn't do this to bring the glory unto himself. He was a minister. He came to serve. He came to help people, and it wasn't to bring glory unto him. We're going to see a little bit later again in this chapter where he heals the blind and he gives them their sight again. He says, you know what? Don't tell anybody. Jesus did not look for his own glory on this earth at all. He didn't do that. Now, he will be glorified. And he has a name above every other name because of everything that he went through. And honor doesn't come to something. You don't take honor upon yourself. You, you can't just say like, oh, well, I am this good and boast of yourself because God's going to bring you low for that. The proud person, you don't get honored for lifting yourself up. You get honored when other people honor you. You keep your head down, you do your work, you do what you're supposed to do, and you let other people lift you up. That's how people get honored truly, and that's how people are exalted. And that's why Jesus' name is exalted above every other name, because he became the humblest of the humble. He, he lowered himself to be in the form of a, of, a, of a man, of a human being, and of a servant, and allowed himself to suffer the shame of the cross. And, and bear the sins of the whole world. He did all of that. And he did all of that willingly. And he did all of that out of love for us. So because of everything that he did, his name gets exalted. And if you want your name to be exalted, you can't go around puffing up yourself and talking about all the great works that you do. The works that we do for God ought to bring glory unto God. It ought not to be. And, you know, I've, I said this from day one. From day one. From the first sermon I preached at Stronghold Baptist Church that it's not about the name that we can get. It's not about the name that our church gets. It's about exalting the name of Jesus Christ. It's about bringing honor and glory unto God. So when you walk in the foyer and you see you know, the salvations and stuff, that's not for our honor and glory. That's for God's glory. That's for people to say, Amen, praise the Lord. Praise God that his work is being done here. Praise God that he's, he's working through people here to bring the gospel to the lost. Amen. Praise God for that. He hasn't given up on people here. There's still hope. Praise the Lord. That's the point of that. That's the point of what's in our bulletin. That's the point of what we're doing. Any works that you're doing, it's not for self-aggrandizement. It's, it's, to, it's to bring honor and glory unto God. And when it's, when it's truthful and when it's righteous, I think the people recognize that. And they did with Jesus Christ. Jesus healed this man. And what did the people do? They glorified God, which had given such power unto men. Verse number nine. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Now, when it says they're sitting at the receipt of of custom receipt. If you know what a receipt is, you always get a little piece of paper as a receipt. It's just a document showing that you paid for something. That's what you've received. Okay, they've given that to you. The receipt of custom, if you think of what you'll say, well, what is custom? It's not like a tradition. Custom is like customs and duties. It's taxes. So what he's doing is he's sitting at the place where people pay taxes. He was a collector of taxes. He was a receiver of taxes. He was a tax man. Not a very well-liked guy. <laughs> okay? Sorry, Brother Tom, but <laughs> the tax man is not a very well-liked guy. <laughs> but here he is, even the tax man. Okay, Jesus is able to help this guy. He said, hey, come and follow me. And he becomes one of Jesus' disciples because he leaves what he's doing and he follows Jesus Christ. Now, here's what I was talking about earlier when I had mentioned that, you know, there's some things that you won't get and you might even pass over if you don't read all the Gospels. This is the only place in the account of the story we're going to find out that his name is Matthew because Matthew has another name. 
In Mark chapter 2, verse 14, we're going to see a, the parallel passage for this. And then also in Luke chapter 5, Mark 2, 14 says, And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of, com uh, of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And ver in Luke chapter 5, verse 27, the Bible reads, And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi. So all, right away, before I even get any further, there's so many things that you can see will start to make more sense to you as you put these passages next to each other. First of all, we realize here we see Matthew. I mean, we're reading the book of Matthew, which is the only gospel that says his name is Matthew or we could compare it with others because his name was Levi. Now, don't let that bother you and be like, oh, man, the, the Bible's like there's a mistake in the scripture. There's an error. That one said Levi. This one says Matthew. Well, which one is it? Yes. <laughs> The answer is they are, they are all true because, it, it, I mean, because basically it's the same guy. Okay, two different names for the same guy. We see that multiple times in Scripture. The, the, the most common or famous one probably is like Simon Peter, right? Cephas, Simon, Peter, all the same person. It's one individual. Matthew, Levi, same guy. But the other thing we see here, too, is that when it says he sat at the receipt of custom, he's a tax man. Well, if you want to know what a publican is, uh, Luke 5, 27 said, and after these things, he went forth and saw a publican. So Matthew was a publican. Why was he a publican? Because he sat at the receipt of custom, because he is receiving taxes. That makes him a publican. So when you read in the Bible, publicans and sinners, publicans and sinners, well, what's a publican? You could learn the definition of these things just by reading God's Word. You don't even have to go to a dictionary for that. Now, the dictionary probably has the right definition, but I'm just saying, you know, as you read Scripture, you can compare it side by side. You can gain this understanding and learn these things just by being real careful and looking at all the words and seeing how they fit together. It says, he saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom and said unto him, follow me. And then in Luke chapter 5, we get a little bit more information here. I'll just read this for you. Verse number 28 says, and he left all, rose up and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them. Now, we're going to go back to Matthew chapter 9, but I just continued reading there because we're going to find ourselves in Matthew 9 in this same place, but we don't realize that it was Matthew himself that invited Jesus and everybody to his house to have this feast. We just know that we're in a house in Matthew chapter 9. But Luke 5 tells us, well, he makes this great feast in his own house and he invites his friends, which are other publicans, right? Because I think the only friends that publicans had were probably other publicans because... No one else really wants to be friends with the tax guy, right? So it's got to, you're, all of his other public and friends come over. And, um, and this is what Jesus is being criticized for also. So here's a guy. Jesus says, follow me. He leaves all and follow him. Hey, you know what? That's a guy I want to spend some time with. Someone who, when Jesus says, follow me, drops everything and says, okay, Lord, I'll follow you. And you know what? I'm so thankful. Why don't you come into my house? And you know, is Jesus too good and say, oh, no, I can't be seen at the publican's house? No, that's what the Pharisees say. That's what the Pharisees think. And you have anybody, you know, modern day that's going to be too good to be just seen with somebody. Oh, no. What, is, what will people think? What will people think? If, if I go to this person's house, hey, they said they wanted to follow Jesus. He didn't care what people thought about him. Verse 10 in Matthew chapter 9. The Bible says, And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? Oh, what's he doing over there? What's he doing with all those sinners over there? Huh? And notice how the Pharisees don't have the guts to confront Jesus Christ. They have to go to his disciples. Oh, hey, hey, why, why is he sitting down over there? Huh? And, and watch out for that, too. I've seen this happen a lot. People will not go. Like, I've been in churches, especially with strong leadership. I've been in Faithful Word Baptist Church, where you get someone comes in that just wants to cause trouble and stir up problems. They won't go to the pastor because they know they're going to get shut down right away 
and they're going to you know, send them out, they'll go to other people just within the church. Oh, well, how come? And just start railing on the leader. And watch out for that. Okay, and don't, and don't let people intimidate you or scare you or you know, make you back up. Oh, well, uh, you know, and we don't see exactly what, what the disciples are thinking or going to say because Jesus just interjects. He sees what's going on over there and he calls them out. The Bible says in verse number 12 here, but when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. And we're going to get into this a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to wait a little bit further and come back to this verse specifically uh, because I think it has a, a, a greater meaning than just that. But ultimately he's saying, look, the reason why I'm sitting with publicans and sinners is because they need a physician. They need healing. They need someone to help them out. So that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to heal. So who else am I going to go to but the people who need healing? When we go out and preach the gospel, we're not trying to find all the saved people and knock on their door and give them the gospel. They're already saved. That's why we don't preach the gospel every Sunday at church. Because we're trying to be preaching to saved people. We go out and bring the gospel to the lost. And yeah, we want to bring them in. We want to get them saved and bring them into God's house. We're not going to just keep preaching salvation, salvation, salvation. Look. You're already whole. If you're saved, <laughs> you've already, you already have that. You need more. You need something else. Jesus came and, and he says, you know what? If you're whole, you don't need a physician. But this is, this is good. You know, we're going to come back to this, but I take this literally as well as figuratively. I don't go to the doctor every month, every six months, every year to just go to the doctor for him to tell me that there's something wrong with me when I'm just fine, when I'm well. If I'm whole, what do I need to go to a doctor for? Because you know what? There's a lot of physicians of no value out there. There's a lot of people that, oh, you're coming to see what's wrong? I'll tell you something that's wrong, <laughs> right? I mean, you bring your car into a mechanic, everything's been working fine. Can you just see if there's anything wrong? Oh, man, yeah, it's a good thing you brought this in because you need a whole new transmission. What? But everything's working. Yeah, um, yeah I know, but I mean, it's 120,000 miles now and, and you're due. Look, it's fine. It's working. Now, I'm not saying that's, ne you know, you could never identify a problem, right? But ultimately what Jesus is teaching here is true. I mean, ultimately it is because he said it. And if you're well... You don't need a physician. That's not to say you can't know if something's not right with you. You know, there may be something happening, but in which case you would need a physician. And notice, too, the flip side of that, too. He says, but they that are sick, they that are sick should go to a physician. You ought to go to a physician. And you know what? I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because that's, that's planned for a little bit further as we get into this because we see Jesus. Uh, you know what? Forget it. I'll just go into it now. I already started. <laughs> Doesn't matter. There are a lot of people out there who want to just... We see a lot of healing, right, by Jesus Christ. We also read about people, you know, in the book of James, it tells us, hey, if any's sick, let him call for the elders of the church that they may pray over him, right? And they, and they anoint him with oil and they pray over him that, that the, the prayer of faith can save him and heal him. And I believe that to be true. I believe in the healing power of prayer. I believe that miracles are still done by God. I believe that all of that is still possible. However, I do not take the position that you should never go to a physician and only pray and only do that. No, I believe that the Bible teaches that we should go to God first. Pray to God first. We bring all of our needs to God first. But that doesn't mean that that absolves you from doing anything about it then. And that, this applies to not just your health, but all matters, right? Imagine, here's an easier way to understand this. You lose a job. 
You know what I'm going to do when I lose a job? You know what I've done when I've lost a job? I go to God first. God, please help me. I need to work. I need to support my family. God, please help me. I'm looking to you. I need your help. And then you know what I do? I get up and I start looking for a new job. That's what you do. You go to God first. It's not that I'm not trusting God or don't rely on God. I completely trust him, but I'm going to trust that he's going to guide my path. I'm going to trust that he's going to help me to get what I need to do, but I'm going to still do something. And I believe it's the same way with our health. I'm going to go to God first. Hey, any problems I have, I'm going to God. But after I go to God, now I'm going to, until God heals... I'm going to try to do what I can. I'm going to seek out a physician that's going to be able to help me. I'm going to try to do what I can to, to get myself or my loved one well. But the first thing that we do is we go to God. We have an example of this with Asa. So now I need to skip ahead in my notes because I already had this planned out. But in 2 Chronicles 16, uh, if you don't have, you can turn there if you'd like. In 2 Chronicles 16, we're going to see a story of Asa. Asa was a great guy. He was a man that believed God. He, he had a, you know, a righteous father. He, lived, he, had a, he had a pretty good rule, a reign as a king. And um, he did a lot for God, especially early on. But then a little bit later, he started having lapses in faith. So early in his life, he had these great victories where he just relied on God. And God delivered him from the enemy. And they were greatly outnumbered. And they had this awesome victory. But then later on... He goes and hires mercenaries and hires help and isn't completely just trusting and have that same faith and trusting in God to deliver them out of, out of their, their trials. And he kind of suffers for that. And then even after that, he ends up getting a disease in his feet. And it says in verse number 11 of 2 Chronicles 16, it says, And behold, the acts of Asa first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. So he starts off with a small disease and it just gets worse and worse and worse and builds. And then he has, it's a really great problem. I mean, it's a big problem, this disease in his feet. It says, yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. He didn't go to God for help. He just went to man. And I don't think we should just be seeking out man's wisdom when we're sick, we go to God, we go to God first. We rely on God. But after that, hey, if you're not whole, as Jesus said, you need a physician. And there's nothing wrong going to the physician when you first go to the Lord. Putting God first in everything is what the Bible teaches. Um, Now that I'm out of order, we'll come back to this and we'll skip ahead. Jump down in Matthew chapter 9. Go back to Matthew chapter 9. And we're going to look at verse number 18. The Bible says, While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years, came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. So in the story, he's on his way to go heal someone and actually go raise this, this girl back from the dead. Okay, this girl died and this guy came to him. He's a ruler and he says, hey, I know that if you, know, if you just touch her, you can bring her back to life. So another person that has this faith that Jesus can heal and save his daughter that has died. And on his way there, there's this other woman that, that comes into contact with him. This woman has had this disease, an issue of blood. She's had this hemorrhaging problem where she's had this for 12 years. I mean, this has been plaguing this woman. And we're going to read from Mark chapter 5 some more information about this story as well. And she's like, man, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be made whole. And that's what she does. Now, in verse number 25 of Mark chapter 5, the Bible says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse 
when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may but touch, his, may, may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. What the Bible tells us in Mark 5 that we didn't see in Matthew chapter 9 is that she had gone to the physicians first. She had sought out their help, and she had been to many physicians and suffered many things and went to them and, and you know, they're trying to treat her and do this, do that, and putting her through the gamut. And she spent all of her money trying to get healed. And it says she was nothing better. They didn't help at all, but in fact, she grew worse. So this treatment that she's getting from these doctors is making things even worse. They're not helping her at all. And look, this very thing happens today. There are diseases that people have where I think the physicians today are doing more harm than good. Now, look, don't misquote me or misunderstand me. I'm not saying all physicians are bad. But I am saying that there are diseases out there and there are problems that doctors don't really know how to heal. At least many doctors or even the majority of doctors and the treatments that they put people through oftentimes can end up being worse for the person than the disease itself. And the one that, that just, just blares out to me is cancer. How many people you see that get cancer end up going to these doctors who give them this chemotherapy and this radiation that destroys their body? I mean, their whole body is just impacted by the treatment of the disease more so than the disease themselves. The reason why you look at people and say, oh man, it looks like that person has cancer. It's not that you look at that person and it looks like they have cancer. It looks like they have chemotherapy. It looks like they have radiation because that's what really is destroying their body. So what they're doing is because they, they, they're not able to narrow it down well enough and be able to, to, to cure the disease that they have, they kind of hit it with a bazooka. Right? I mean, they're, they're just throwing everything at it in order to kill the, the cancerous cells that are, that are growing. And in so doing, it damages so many other parts of the body and people end up dying oftentimes um, as a result of that. Now, it doesn't mean that, it, that they could never heal anyone that way. But, um, you know, depending on each situation, each type of cancer, obviously, there are, I'm not trying to lie to you and just misrepresent you know, everything about it. But there's so many people, I've known people have had cancer and their quality of life goes way down. They suffer many things. It costs everything. You know, it really does just cost all of your money. And what people need to be doing first and foremost is going to Jesus. Amen. Go to Jesus first. That's right. He is capable of healing. Now, I'm not saying do nothing after that, but seek out a physician of value. The Bible talks about there's physicians of no value in the book of Job. Job you know, calls his friends, you're physicians of no value. You're like one of these guys that you charge a bunch of money, but you're not helping at all. You're not healing at all. And when people get deceived into the wrong way of thinking, the wrong approach, and, you know, and this goes back to just getting wisdom from Scripture, getting wisdom and knowledge, starting with this is our foundation of truth and righteousness and applying this to everything around us. How are we going to interpret things? What makes sense even just for healing? What is it that makes sense? God created our bodies amazingly. And the more you study the way that God made us, the better you're going to be able to determine how a good uh, way to help it's going to be. What, what you always want to do with your health is help the body to do what it was already designed to do. Because God made it good. We don't need to go trying to improve upon what God created, what God made within us. What he made is very good. So whatever we can do to help the body perform all, all the organs, all the different aspects, perform the functions they're supposed to do is what's going to give you the best healing. That's why I think, you know, the, the, uh, a healthy life starts with your diet, what you're consuming, what you're putting into your body, what is feeding everything on the inside that God created. So it's able to work the way that it was intended. Eating the foods that God made. Not that have been processed and filled with chemicals and everything else that are supposed to help you. And, oh, this is so much better. And, you know, we're able to, to introduce all these extra hormones and make things grow bigger and fatter to give you more food. Well, 
who cares about having more food? I just want, I want real food. I don't want Franken food. I want the stuff that's going to go in and become a part of me because what God created, you know, literally what you are, what you eat. You've heard that before. I heard that growing up my whole life. You are what you eat. It's a true statement because your body absorbs in the, in the food, everything that, that, you know, all the good parts that come out of the food become part of your body in one way or another. And since God designed us, I want the food that God made to become part of my body, not what man thought he could improve upon in our food supply and what he's going to add to the food that's going to become part of my body. You know, ultimately, I believe that's where cancer comes from anyways. It's from all of the chemicals and other, and other additives and things that, that man has done introduced into the food supply that's going to not work the way that it, that, because man has limited knowledge and there's unintended consequences with things that, oh, well, we never thought about that. Never thought that that was going to hurt people that way. Oops. Just stick with God's plan, folks. All right, let's go back in Matthew chapter 9. Verse number 13. So Jesus, back to get us back in, the, in where we were in sequence here, he's rebuking these Pharisees that were talking unto the disciples saying, well, why does he eat with publicans and sinners? And he answers, hey, you know, they that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. That's why he's there. And then he says further, but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He said, I'm going to have mercy. Not to, he's like, I'm not demanding sacrifices for them to be saved. I'm going to have mercy on them. It's grace. It's faith. And that's why they're there. It's not, you know, because they're, they're trusting in their own works and their own righteousness and their own sacrifices to get them in. He's saying, it's not, I'm not, I'm going to have mercy not sacrifice. And, um, but they, obviously they still don't get it. Let's keep reading verse number 14. And then came to him the disciples of John saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them and then shall they fast. So they go, hey, you know, disciples of John, these are good guys. They're saying, you know, we're fasting a lot. The Pharisees, they're fasting a lot. So how come your disciples aren't fasting? They're like, what, you know, what's the deal here? Now, first of all, I would say, why are the disciples of John still when Jesus is on the scene? So I think they're a little bit skewed right, right off the bat since the Bible is identifying them as being disciples of John instead of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because John himself was pointing people to Jesus, saying, hey, he must increase, I must de decrease. You know, there's the Lamb of God, follow him. Yet these people are still, you know, like, no, we're disciples of John. They come to Jesus saying, hey, you know, we're fasting, the Pharisees are fasting. Well, how come your disciples aren't fasting? And he explains real, real briefly and easily, well, hey, look, you know, the bridegroom, people aren't sad, they're not mourning. And notice there the, the connection with mourning, with fasting. Fasting is not like a joyous thing. It's something that, that you're afflicting your soul. You're, you're in heaviness as you fast. That's one of, the, one of the things that goes along with fasting. There's a purpose for it. It's not just a ritual. And when I see this, where they're saying, you know, they fast often, to me that almost sounds just ritualistic. Yeah. I mean, it's, well, I fast every Monday. Or, you know, then it's kind of like, well, what's the point? That, that's not the purpose even of fasting is just to make it become some habit and some ritual. It's when you're in great need and when you, when you have a strong desire that needs to be met, when you have a, a petition to, to God and some need that needs to be met and you're afflicting your soul and you're mourning and you're weeping and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're wearing sackcloth and ashes. This is what we see when people are, are just really humbled and, and want to get God's attention. That's when they fast. It's not just this religious exercise of a habitual thing. And he says, hey, the children of the bride chamber, 
are they going to mourn when the bridegroom's with them? No, it's a joyous time. When you're with the bridegroom, hey, man, this is great. The bridegroom, it's his special day. He's going to get married. We're, you know, we're, we're, we're hanging out with him. Then when he's not hanging out with you anymore, then you could, you know, be a little bit more upset. It's not quite as, as joyous. Then he says, the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. He's saying it's not time. That's not appropriate at this time for them to fast because they're with me. They have no reason to be fasting. Jesus is with you. Why, why would you need to be fasting to entreat God when you've got the Son of God with you? There's no point. And he follows this up saying in verse 16 and 17, No man putteth a piece of new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put the new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, obviously, verses 16 and 17 fit together. He's basically describing the same type of thing using two different illustrations. And what both of them have in common is he's applying something new to something that's old. So in the sense of a, of a garment, if you have an old, worn piece of fabric, whatever it is in the clothing, and you put something brand new on there, you know, the new fabric's going to be real tight and, and new, but old fabrics would be more worn and easier to tear. And when you put the new thing on there, you think, oh, I'm patching up this garment. It's going to help it out. But when you use that brand new piece, that's stronger than everything else around it. And what's going to happen then is because that's stronger, the rest of it's just going to rip away and then make even a bigger hole in, the, in place. You're not really going to fix it. And then he uses the illustration with wine. He's saying, well, if you use these old bottles, because when you store the wine, there's going to be some, you know, it's going to expand a little bit and uh, it's going to break those old bottles. You need to keep the new with the new. If you're patching something new, use something new. If you're patching something old, you know, stick with something that's old. And um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not, th this has to tie in, I believe, with the verse right before that when he's talking about the, the children of the, of the bride chamber and the bridegroom that's with him. And um, I haven't completely put this one together with the new versus the old, but the only thing that kind of came to my mind, and, and again, this is, this is not, um, I'm not being very dogmatic about this, is, you know, Jesus is bringing in the New Testament. He's bringing in something new. And these guys, that's kind of like their old way of thinking with the Pharisees, you know, fasting often and doing things that way. And he's saying, you know what, don't bring that old way in with the new because there's no place here. This is the new way of doing things. I'm showing you a way that's different from what the Pharisees did. This is a new way. And that's kind of where I'm at with, with the explanation on this passage. But feel free, if you've got a different take on that after service, you know, let me know what you think about that. Um, but let's keep reading here. Verse number, well, we, we read through verse number 18 through 21. Let's jump down to... Um, Verse number 22, the Bible says, But Jesus turned him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Now, we've seen throughout here, you know, this is the woman who had the issue of blood. And he tells her, Hey, you know, be of good cheer. Don't be worried. Don't be afraid. Uh, your faith made you whole. And we, I brought this up in the past, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth. We have some false prophets today, and there's always been false prophets, but we see these guys have gotten really popular, these televangelists. They're, you know, they're known as the faith healers. And these are really wicked guys. And they take scriptures like this, like all throughout the Gospels, where he, Jesus, oh, he saw their faith, and he said, hey, your faith has saved thee, and all this stuff. And they'll tell people that you need to have faith to be healed. But then they'll say like, well, if you don't have enough faith, then you won't be healed. And they kind of hold this over their head and make people feel bad. Like, oh man, I'm, I'm sick. I'm diseased. Well, you just don't have enough faith to be healed. And I'll tell you what, that's wicked. We never, ever see Jesus going to someone saying, you know what? No, you can't be healed. You just don't quite have enough faith. That's yeah. Never once. The Bible says you just need the faith as a grain of a mustard seed to be saved. 
That's, you, you don't need this huge amount. You need to, you go to Christ in faith, he's going to heal you. Amen. That's the bottom line. That's not something that's supposed to be turned on its head and telling me, well, you just don't quite, you're not believing hard enough. You don't quite have enough faith. And they hold this over people's head and get them then to buy into, well, I have this great faith. So God's given me this great power to heal. So send in your money to me and then I'll send you this special handkerchief for a limited time only. We only have like a hundred of these. Okay, and they're going fast. So send in your money now. And I've said a special blessing over these. The power of God is on these things. And you can have it. And once you get that, you know, you still got to believe. But you use that and it's going to heal you. And then someone says, oh, I got this. I wasn't healed. Well, you weren't believing enough. I mean, I gave you all that I could to help you out but you still weren't believing enough. And it's all just a sham, and these guys are frauds. It's the, it's the Kenneth Copelands and the Pat Robertsons and the Benny Hins that are out there that are, that are doing their, their false healings. They set up, they have these big shows, right? They, they rent out these coliseums, and they'll go in, and they have their actors in the front. And the people already picked out, they're going to come up to the front and you're healed and pow you're healed and oh there's someone here and they've got they, they have a problem and they've, they've can walk since they were born and, and who is that here raise your oh yeah it's you right here come on up here God will heal you God will heal you and they make a big circus act out of it a big show and a big trade that's not what Jesus was doing Amen. that alone should tell you these guys are a fraud yeah. they're making a big show did Jesus make a big show when he was healing people no. People came to him. He says, do you believe I can do this? Yes. Okay, go your way. He didn't even have to go and touch him. We saw that last week. The centurion came unto him. He didn't even come to him himself. He sent one of his, you know, one of his people to go and talk to him. He said, hey, just say in a word and he can be healed. Jesus didn't go, no, 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 step back. I need to make sure everybody sees this. Nope. That's not what Jesus did, and yet these people are claiming the name of Jesus. And we don't see his disciples doing that either. When they're going around, they're not making some big stinking show of it. They're healing people because they love people, and they're, and they're doing what they're supposed to do. That's it. They're not ba making a big spectacle out of it. The only time, or the very rare time we see, you know, Jesus is making a point of something... He heals the guy with the palsy just to get through to these people's heads that he has the power to forgive sins, but he's not making some big show of it and doing these interviews. Well, how long have you been a palsy for? Oh, has it been since birth? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> then come on up here in front of everybody. No. He just sees something going on. Hey, man, your sins are forgiven you. The difference with those charlatans and with Jesus Christ, is that those actors, I think, travel around from show to show with them. So it's the same people getting healed over and over again. Whereas when Jesus healed someone, they actually get up and walk away, and they're healed. And they actually were sick. <laughs> they actually did have a problem, and people knew it, and that's why people marveled. Because these are all, you see someone on the TV screen, nobody knows that person. No one else in the audience knows who that person is that's getting healed. It's not like, oh, man, yeah, I grew up with that person. I, I was in the same neighborhood with them. I lived with them for 10 years. Yeah, they, they've been wheeling around a wheelchair for the past 50 years. That's not what's happening. There's no stories of that happening with these phonies that are up there trying to just, just get you to, to send them money because the love of money is the root of all evil, and that's all they care about. They don't care about you. That's why they don't preach the truth. Don't fall for these wicked faith healers. We have faith and I believe Jesus can heal. Unfortunately, you got people that, that, have, that have totally abused and butchered the word of God and bringing a bad name upon Christ and making people, unbelievers, think oh man, everybody's nuts now that thinks that Jesus can heal because those guys are frauds. 
and they're painting a really bad picture for Christians in general, which is what all false, false prophets end up doing anyways. They're ruining the name of Christ. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 23. And when Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. So Jesus comes in. This girl is dead. And Jesus comes in and he says, All right, you know, like, like don't worry, basically. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. And when it says they laughed him to scorn, they're basically just mocking him. Like, well, you don't think we know that she's dead? You know, like, what do you think? She's sleeping? Yeah, right. You know, and they're just, they're mocking Jesus for saying she's not dead, she's sleeping. Now, Jesus knows that she's physically dead, but one of the things that we see in Scripture, I believe, is that when someone's referred to as, as like sleeping, it's always talking about saved people. Their body is asleep because it's going to be reunited one day at the resurrection and that person is still alive because if they have eternal life they're always alive Amen. whether or not they're in the body or out of the body they're still alive so he's not referring he's and he's you know sometimes he's very careful with his words even with Lazarus right he says Lazarus sleepeth and he was referring to his death but he's but he's Lazarus was a saved guy. So when Lazarus physically died, he wasn't, he wasn't dead. His body was in the grave. Jesus knew that. And Jesus said, well, no, he's sleeping. The same thing with this maid, this girl. No, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And he came to bring her back forth. Now, physically, yes, her body was dead, which makes this all the more a great miracle. But that's why these people are kind of mocking him and scorning him because they're saying, she's dead. You know, you're crazy. She's not, she's not just sleeping. It says in verse 25, But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame hereof went abroad into all that land. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I'm able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. I think it's amazing. In one chapter, we've just gone through about 30 verses. How many times have people been healed and been healed of very, very serious things? I mean, there's a guy that was sick of the palsy. Four guys were carrying him. These two guys are blind. And he gives them sight. There's a girl that died that he brought back to life. Any one of these things is just incredible. It's huge. This is, this is marvelous. Imagine someone having the power to do this even to one person. And we're just reading over and over and over and over and over again all of these great things that Jesus did. And it's almost like, did you notice how few verses this girl's brought back from the dead? Like, this is a huge thing. And so you could just read right over that. It's just, well, just keep on going and going and going. Don't let this volume of miracles make any one of them any less of a miracle to you. Allow it to just open your eyes to how truly awesome and amazing God is and the power that God has and who Jesus is and how great healing he is able to perform. Nothing, nothing is too hard for the Lord. Nothing is impossible. He proves it up and down all the time, every day we're reading this. And that's why the book of John says, you know what? If, if, if everything that Jesus did, I'm paraphrasing, was written down, you know, the world wouldn't be able to contain the books. We are reading this, this summary version of years of ministry, and it's just miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. The amount of work that Christ did on this, wor on this, world, on this world, this earth world, is incredible. 
this is also why when you look at the people who are just unbelievable, you know, these people that hated Jesus, that's also kind of incredible. Be like, wow, how can you? How can you witness it, hear it, see it all over the place and still just reject the Son of God? That to me just blows me away. Um, I mean, this is, and this is all, this isn't, he's not traveling all over the world. He's traveling all over Judah and Israel. I mean, he's like, he's in a, a very relatively small locale. Imagine Jesus coming to Atlanta and, and healing. And he, I mean, you'd be hearing of stories. Yeah, man, there was this guy was blind and now he can see. This guy's deaf and he can hear. This person was dead and he brought her back to life. And this is the girl right here. We can meet her. I know, you know, like, and just be around all the excitement and all the healing. And then just be like, yeah, that guy's not of God. He's teaching every week. He's preaching the gospel. He's doing the work of God. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, that guy's just a fraud. Wait, what? Look, you can spot a fraud. The Joel Osteens, the Benny, you know, these guys, it amazes me that anybody follows them. When I was unsaved, I knew these guys are frauds. I mean, it's, it really isn't that hard. I think sometimes people just, just hear what they want to hear and they just want someone to tell them that they're great and they're special and everything else and they'll just ignore the truth because they're just dying to have somebody tell them what they want to hear. I think it's a willful act that people get sucked into that as opposed to really honestly believing that those guys aren't frauds because it's just so obvious. It's hard for me to imagine that anyone is really that ignorant to, to fall for some of these guys. I, I really, I have a hard time with that. Maybe it's true, but those guys are easy to spot. Jesus made full proof of his ministry beyond any doubts. There, there was, it was infallible proofs, the Bible says, of his resurrection let alone every other miracle that he performed. Take time when you read the scripture and think about these things, you know. Try not to just read over them. Read. Read a lot. Read enough, you know. But don't push yourself so hard that you're just missing a lot of what, of what the Bible's showing us here. Let's finish up. Um, verse number 31. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame in all that country. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying it was never so seen in Israel. Like, no one's ever done this before. And Israel's seen a lot. Israel had the prophets. Israel had all, all the men of God, you know, all throughout the Bible, and they said, this has never been seen in Israel. And they were right. Never the like of Jesus. Verse 34, but the Pharisees said, he casteth out devils through the prince of the devils. And I'm not going to get into that. We can look at the parallels for that. Uh, you go ahead and do that for homework. Verse number 35, and Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. There, in that half a verse, it's summarizing. He went abroad healing every sickness and every disease among the people. I mean, he, all the ones that just aren't even mentioned. These are some big ones. He's going around and he's healing all these sicknesses, all these diseases among the people. I mean, this is just one after the other after the other. There's no way you, could, you cannot run into someone that wasn't affected by Jesus Christ. I mean, he is, he is having such a profound impact on, every, you know, it's like, if he didn't impact you, then you know someone that was. You cannot do that level of works and just not have it well known. So, and this is also why you can't have pity for the people that rejected him. They had every opportunity. Way more. Way more. And we'll get into that next week. Way more than Sodom had. Way more than other wicked cities had, these guys had every opportunity and still rejected. Verse number 36, But when he saw the multitudes, 
So he's still, I mean, he's going around, he's healing, and he still just sees multitudes of people. Man, there's so many people. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He looks on people. Look at the heart that Jesus has. There's just so many people. There's too much for any one person. There's too much for even Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry to go and reach every single person. Thank God that God's plan was for Jesus Christ to die for every person. He was able to taste death for every man. For every person. But while he was physically ministering on this earth, it's just too much. I mean, he gave up sleep. He didn't have a home. He, you know, he, he, he worked, but he just, he just, he says, hey, the, the harvest is plenteous. There are so many people here just, just ready, ready to be reaped and won for the Lord. But the laborers are few. He said, we just need more people. And you know what? We find ourselves in the same problem today. We're going out every single week and leading people to Christ. You know what that tells me? The harvest is still plenteous. When we start going out and there's just nobody's getting saved, just, just man, we feel like we're banging our heads, then I'll start to say, well, maybe the harvest is dwindling. That's not what's happening. Because the more time we spend out, the more people are getting saved. We need to pray that God will send more laborers to his harvest. And that's another reason why our church is here. This is, this is a, a lighthouse and a beacon calling all laborers. Amen. Hey, you want to work for the Lord? Come here. Come here to Stronghold Baptist Church because there's a great harvest out there. And we need to reap. And we need to wake up early and stay up late and, and burn the midnight oil and get out there and preach the gospel and do the work for our master. God wants there to be a great harvest. We're laborers for him. We need to go out and do the work for him and not faint and not backslide and not get lazy. Let's push ourselves and do even more. And if you find yourself, you've been backsliding and you've been out of church and you haven't been going soul winning, get back in because the harvest is great and the laborers are few and God needs more laborers. Amen. I'm not the one that needs laborers. God, he's the one who's calling for the laborers. Jesus is the one saying, hey, pray for more laborers. And the first thing that I would say is, What are you doing praying for more laborers if you're not a laborer? You got nowhere else to look but to yourself before you go say, God, send more laborers. God, send more laborers. Well, why don't you go? And then you pray for more laborers. I think God wants to hear the prayer of those who are already out there working going, man, there's a lot of work to be done. God, God, send some more laborers our way. We've got more work to do than from the guy that's sitting on his rear Going, oh, God, wouldn't it be great to send, you know, increase our church and send more people are going to work? Well, how about you? Now, look, thank God we've got a church of, like, virtually 100% participation and so on. I could not, I'm not displeased at all. I think the church is amazing. And, but we need more laborers. Make that one of your prayers. We got the prayer request. Write, write that in. Just put laborers. Add laborers to your prayer request and go pray for these people when you go home and pray that God will send more laborers because that's what we need. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, esteeming us worthy to uh, have the job of being ambassadors for you, Lord. I pray that you would please help us to not get weary in well-doing and not to faint but that you would strengthen us and embolden us and help us to go out and do the work that you've set before us. Lord, uh, you truly are amazing, and I pray that we would never forget that and help us to be stirred up in our souls and our spirits because 
you're just so awesome that, that people need to hear about you, Lord, and, and all the works that you've done and all the healing that you can provide. Lord, help us to, to show other people that and to preach the gospel to every creature, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.